right, and welcome to my design stream. Uh, this is a stream to demonstrate how to design classes for World of Dungeons. Uh, so World of Dungeons is a uh, very simple, uh, very minimalist uh, RPG in the OSR style that is based off of Dungeon World, uh, but very, very easy to hack and very easy to learn. Um, so first I just want to take a quick look over the rules of, Worlds of World of Dungeons because uh, this game is so simple we can just easily uh, go through it right now. So World of Dungeons, um, it has the standard six stats you would expect from D&D. Um, then it has a list of skills. Uh, and a list of special abilities that your character can pick. Uh, these are the abilities that the default classes have. Uh, it's based for your weapons and equipment. Uh, you can mark your armor and speed, hit points, or hit dice and hit points. Um, you have a level, you have a class, you have a character name, you have coin, and your coin gets you XP, which you use to level up. All right, so uh, you can pick equipment. It costs a certain amount of silver pieces. You start with 60. Um, these are, you know, very uh, basic items. Uh, there's, you know, light weapons, martial weapons, great weapons, some examples of what they are. You can make them whatever you want, um, you know, as long as they generally fit into the concept of what these are supposed to be. Um, bows heavy bows and guns, um, and uh, notably adventuring gear. Uh, so all this stuff, rope, spikes, chalk, parchment, you don't need to take uh, that specifically. You just buy adventuring gear and then you can use that stuff whenever you uh, want to. Um, so, aside from that, there are tools, uh, cult items used for rituals, uh, fancy items you might use for social things, um, fire oil, boats, carts, taverns, property, horses, things you might want to hire, um, hirelings you can, you can grab, uh, magic, there's a very basic magic system, um, essentially you can summon spirits uh, with the magic system. And in order to do so, uh, you need to use either one hour of uninterrupted ritual, a dose of Quicksilver. Uh, so you, you probably uh, are gonna use a lot of Quicksilver if you are a, a magic user, um, and, or a magic item containing a bound spirit, which you can, you can create or you can find. Um, and yeah, each spirit has a domain um, this is similar to Spirit Binding and Burning Wheel. Um, you, you just uh, command it to do something in its domain and it has a, a basic amount of damage it can do uh, with magic. So that's the, the basic rules there uh, for what sort of things you can get. Um, and then we have the general rule summary. Um, so to make a character, uh, you roll 2d6 for each stat. Uh, all six stats. Uh, on a six minus, uh, you get a zero in that stat. Uh, on a seven to nine, you get a plus one. On a 10 or 11, the value is two plus, and on a 12, you get a three in that, plus three in that stat. Um, you choose one skill in addition to any granted by your class. So skills are these things here, right? Uh, they, are, they are the sort of skills you would be familiar with uh, from D&D. Um, like make a lore check, right? Make an athletics check. That, that's something you would be familiar with from D&D. <clears throat> then, um, after you choose a skill, you get uh, your HP. Uh, so you have one hit die plus the extra hit dice equal to your constitution, um, your con mod, right? Uh, so you could have like up to four hit dice to roll at level one. Um, when you rest, you can re-roll them. Uh, and here's here are the classes, the basic classes in the game. There's fighters, uh, they get athletics, 
and then you can choose two special abilities out of this list of four and all the classes follow the same format so for example the fighter gets skirmish uh, gives them plus one damage and uh, worn armor counts as one type lighter uh, so that's pretty nice um, tough plus one armor slay plus two melee damage and hardy plus six hp um, so yeah i mean uh, if you were rolling uh, one hit die and you can get an extra so that's a that's only six hp max you can get an extra six hp flat six hp uh, that's pretty good when you start out uh, and generally games of uh, world of dungeons don't tend to go on so long that you would get a di uh, an HP pool, a hit dice pool, a hit dice pool, I should say, uh, that would be so large that that wouldn't be worth anything. Um, yeah, and then it's kind of the same for the rest down the line. Uh, and you can make your own class, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. You choose a class skill and two special abilities. That's it, that's all it takes to do. You just choose a class skill and two special abilities, and you have a class. So you might be wondering, like, what's the point of making a class, right? Um, it's so simple, why wouldn't you just kind of pick a couple things and run with it? Well, as a player in World of Dungeons, I find that there's a certain amount of value in just going through the exercise of making a class. It's like a kind of way to make a character concept. Um, and if you take a look here uh, at these classes, which I created in the World of Dungeons campaign that I played, uh, I guess it was last year, yep. Um, you can see that I kind of wrote up some notes about uh, what I was thinking when I made these classes. So the first one I made was the Provisioner. Um, and I wrote, with the Provisioner, I was looking to take some elements from the excellent Halfling Burglar class in Torchbearer and port them to World of Dungeons. Uh, this is a support class through and through, but as with any World of Dungeons class, if you shrewdly manipulate the fictional positioning, it can contribute to the party in many situations. So that's something to really take into account uh, in World of Dungeons. It might seem like the rules are so simple, there's no room for expression. But really, most of the player expression is outside of what the class defines. It's, it's more in like what sort of things you pick up and how you use them. Uh, it's very OSR. Um, that was the intention and, and it, it delivers, right? Um, so what these things really do is they give you uh, abilities and, and stats that you can use in a pinch uh, if you need to. Um, and also they help inform the fictional positioning that you do in play. Uh, so here's what I did with the Provisioner. So the Provisioners get Survival, which is one of these skills, right? Uh, right there, Survival. Um, and they can choose two special abilities. Uh, one of them is entertain. Uh, when you camp, you can give the party members D6 hold that gives plus one on a roll of their choice. Um, so that's maybe a little bit strong, uh, but uh, it was still fun to use in play. Uh, forage. Uh, once per day, you can discover two travel rations from the natural environment. Right, so if you're a provisioner, if you're somebody who is there to take care of making food and and uh, collecting food, then you need to be able to forage. Uh, bivouac, you can give the party plus two to awareness, heal, and survival rolls while camped. Uh, so you make a nice camp for everybody. Um, and hardy, right? Like maybe you are um, well-fed or somebody who knows what a nutritious meal looks like. <laughs> so you have more HP. Um, it's also just easy to uh, it's also just easy to go ahead and uh, throw Hardy in, in any kind of class. Uh, so the next one I made was the Adept. Um, the Adept is uh, inspired by reading uh, Journey to the West, uh, the, the classic of Chinese literature, the, the basis of Dragon Ball. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is a really good story, really good adventure story. 
Um, and I was really inspired by reading about the Taoist sages in that, in that book uh, and wanted to make a World of Dungeons class around them because I was used to playing monks in like Dungeons and Dragons that were similar to Shaolin monks, but uh, playing a Taoist adept was something I'd never done before and I'm, I'm still kind of looking forward to trying it out um, in uh, the uh, Asian uh, 7th C uh, source books that are coming out um, sometime this year, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a class I want to explore in that game. Uh, but I did get to explore it in World of Dungeons and had a hell of a good time with it. Um, so what I wrote was, uh, well, adepts in tabletop RPGs are often based on the Shaolin monks. This adept class was based more on the concept of Taoist sages, as found in Journey to the West, or also known as Monkey. Uh, the adept is a seeker of the true way, which will allow them to transcend the limitations of ordinary mortals. So they get awareness, because, um, you know, they have heightened awareness. They have a heightened state of consciousness. Um, and uh, they choose two special abilities. So one of them is Sealed Vessel. Uh, you are resistant and resilient to poisons, diseases, thought probing, and mind control. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Depending on the campaign you're playing in, uh, could be of various usage. Uh, I don't think I use this one because these things never came up in my campaign that I was playing in. Uh, Spout Profundities. Uh, you may persuade others with wisdom instead of charisma by using a display of your sagacity. Uh, that's pretty pretty cool. I like that. Um, you know, it gives an incentive to role play. Um, internal alchemy. When you camp and sit in quiet meditation, roll 1d6 minus 3 with a minimum result of 0. Take that many hold. Uh, spend 1 for 1 to get plus 1 on a roll. So that one's a little bit more balanced than what we had with the provisioner. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 um, it definitely came in handy here and there uh, when I was playing with this class. The last one I made was the Avatar. Uh, the Avatar is the class that breaks most radically with OSR play conventions. I created this class in order to play as an avatar of a Lakshmi-like fortune goddess who is not aware of her own divine origins. Instead of being a hard scrabble adventurer who gets by with their grit and skill, this character subtly influences those around them with her, their divine essence. Their main way of engaging in combat is using their pet, which I pictured as the kind of animal you see associated with divinities in devotional paintings. Aside from that, it is totally up to the player to manipulate fictional positioning to make this class viable. Um, so the avatar gets heal, uh, and they can choose two special abilities. Uh, pet, you have a loyal and effective animal companion that's the same as the ranger. Um, lucky, once per day, turn a miss into a partial success. Uh, transfix, you can attempt to hold mortals by revealing your divine aura to them. And divine essence, spirits, demons, etc. will recognize you as their equal in spiritual rank and treat you with a respect not afforded to mortals. So like some of these moves can just be things you get in the fictional positioning. Um, they, you know, like, uh, and, and you can write moves uh, that are just like a description and then it's up to the GM to interpret them and turn those into to skill checks or not skill checks, uh, stat checks. Yeah, so this was a interesting class to play because as I said, it, it really breaks with the conventions of D&D, it breaks with the conventions of OSR. Um, I kind of tried to play this class as like a Monster Hearts character in a D&D game. Um, and that was really interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, it didn't work that well, but I was kind of just doing this as a way to test the boundaries of what World of Dungeons can do. Um, and it was such an easy thing to write this class up and do the testing um, that I really still had a good time at just kind of like a design level, even if my character, as interesting as she was in the fiction, never really got um, the kind of spotlighting or opportunity to show off her stuff um, that a more active adventuring uh, uh, character would. 
so I, I kind of let this character fade into the background of scenes and then have moments where I would step forward and, and, and display my divine aura and, and use this to, to shape the fiction in a big way. Um, but, you know, when it came to fighting monsters, she just kind of let her boar go and do the boar thing and, and fight for her. Um, yeah. So these are the classes I made, um, but let's make some more. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, so it looks like there is nobody in the chat. Don't think. Yep, nobody's around. So I'm going to have to make some decisions myself as to what classes I want to work on. Um, let's see here. These are the different ideas I had. Uh, for example, the adventure geologist. Um, so somebody who's like really knowledgeable about geology and uses that to dungeon crawl. Uh, it could be pretty fun. Uh, the Mediator, this is taken directly from Final Fantasy Tactics, uh, so I was kind of thinking, what if I made a character like that? Um, somebody who can speak to monsters, somebody who is good at inspiring people or charming things, that could be pretty fun. Um, an Engineer, somebody who builds stuff. Uh, a Death Knight, I was kind of thinking like, uh, what is that character's name? Lord Soth? Yeah, Lord Soth. The Knight of the Black Rose. Um, yeah, let's take a look. Uh, a fictional character in the fantasy realms of Dragonlance and later Ravenloft. He is a knight, death knight and fallen knight of Solamnia from the world of Kryn. According to Tracy Hickman, he needed a powerful character for the Heroes of the Lance to fight at the High Clerks Tower, and Lord Soth suddenly came into his mind with a complete history and personality. The popularity of Lord Soth as a character has defined what a Death Knight means to the writers of Dungeon Dra Dungeons & Dragons games over the years. Uh, Soth was also named as one of the greatest villains in D&D history in the final print issue of Dragon. So, um... I remember this character definitely um it was really cool to me as a kid to think that like oh wow like this character started out in Dragonlance and then he became a Ravenloft character like whoa that's so cool um yeah the, the mist of Ravenloft plucked Soth and Karadok from Kryn while the two battled his soul was brought to the domain of Barovia wanting to return to Kryn uh, Soth, Soth sought out Strahd von Zorovic, uh, the ruler of the domain, in the hope that Strahd would help him. Well, not fat chance of that. Uh, Strahd tried to use Soth to his advantage, but this only cost him a red dragon, which was one of these castle's guardians. After a series of adventures with the Vistani girl Magda and the were-badger <laughs> Azrael Dak, Soth had found out that Strahd was hiding Karadik from him. Soth attacked Strahd unceasingly, and the vampire had no choice but to release Karadok in order to keep his domain in one piece. Soth then pursued Karadok until he finally caught him at the edge of the mist. Um, Soth was then given the domain uh, Scythicus, the land of specters in the elven tongue in Ravenloft, by the mist after he exacted his revenge on Karadok's ghost. Uh, his new castle, Nedregard, keep... Uh, Salamnic meaning not Dar Dargard, uh, was made as a mockery of Dargard in Kryn with a continually changing form so Soft could not maintain the military order he was accustomed to. Uh, during the Grand Conjunction, he briefly returned to his Kryn body. Uh, Soft's experiences in Scythicus had changed him only slightly. Throughout his time in the Dread Realm, uh, Soft found himself entering mirror worlds, with each which contained a portion of his past. Through these, he lived in worlds of fantasy, ignoring the world below, beyond his keep. It is believed that his refusal to face his past sins and his willingness to suffer his curse led to his release from the mists. Soft simply withdrew and ignored Scythicus until he was released. Um, yeah. So he's, you know, just so self-obsessed that the world of, of Ravenloft was not interesting to him. Um... Yeah. 
So he basically, what does he do? Although evil and filled with an intense hatred for all living creatures, most of the time Soft retains a semblance of the pride he held as a Salomnic knight um, and fights honorably. He will never ambush an opponent from behind, nor does he strike before his opponent can ready his weapon. Aside from these facts, however, Soth is a terrible enemy. An undead abomination, Soth has inhuman strength, which is further enhanced by his skill with the sword, something he, which he learned as a former Knight of the Rose. Soth can, uh, also can cast various types of spells, including huge fireballs, magical wards, which stun or kill enemies, ice walls, cone of cold, etc. With a single word, Soth can snuff the life out of a red dragon. Uh, this, he can use power word kill or shatter the great city gate of Palanthas, which was formerly known as the Unconquered City. So he's just basically a big badass. Um, but, you know, maybe there's something we could do there with um, with this concept. Um, <laughs> yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, let's continue then. Uh, the Gunner. This is uh, from um, Tactics Ogre, right? Maybe I could do something cool with that. The Merchant. Um, kind of thinking about like the Dragon Quest Merchant here. That could be something to uh, investigate somebody who actually is like really useful when you go back to town <laughs> uh somebody who could i don't know maybe get you like extra xp i don't know like having this like kind of um farming character which is like a really common thing in like etrian odyssey um would be a lot of fun I mean, at least for me as a player, <laughs> like, I don't know if that's fun to most people, but I like to play weird, weird characters that operate on the fringes of the game mechanics um, in a game like this. Uh, an alchemist, right? Um, maybe they can craft interesting stuff. Um, and a sergeant, right? Um, is that spelled right? It isn't. That's not right either. Surgent. Uh, I see. Uh, it's that French. French is French roots of words is getting to me. My spelling. Uh, so that's no good. Um, all right. Fix now. Uh, so yeah, what I had in mind here was the man at arms from Darkest Dungeon. What do they do? Uh, an old battled scarred veteran, the man at arms has seen enough war and bloodshed to last more than a dozen lifetimes. While he can no longer swing his great mace with the force he once could, he should not stand where he swings his mighty weapon. However, it is not offense, but defense that makes the man-at-arms such a vital member of any team. His ability to read his, the enemy's movements allows him to draw fire to himself, to defend his allies, and then retaliate with surprising force. Uh, the battlefield is a chaotic place. And the man-at-arms knows how to make himself heard. With his vociferous shouting, he can issue vital commands to his men or let out a terrible bellow to strike fear into the enemy's heart. Um, at camp, the man-at-arms can take time to instruct and practice with others. So that's pretty cool. Giving efficient information and life-saving instruction. As long as the man-at-arms stands, he will never allow the line to break. Um, so, you know, similar to the uh, Warlord class from... Uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition, uh, which was a super cool class um, and which I had a lot of fun re-implementing in Strike. Um, yeah, okay, so these are our options. Um, I'm actually going to pull the channel 
in Slack here on the gauntlet to see what people are interested in me hacking because I could do any of these. Um, I'll make a straw poll. Maybe I'll just roll a die. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, dice roller. Oops. It's no good. Uh, this should do it. Okay. So how many options do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, let's roll a D eight. Seven. All right. So the alchemist. I'm designing an alchemist. Okay, let's see what we shall do here. Alchemist. Uh, so we need a skill, uh, so let's go look at World of Dungeons. Uh, I think the Alchemist probably uses... I could see Decipher, because like they're used to reading arcane texts. I could see Lore, maybe... Oh yeah, Lore sounds like a good one. Um... Yeah, I'm kind of feeling lore here. Okay, so let's uh, grab some text. Okay, so alchemists get lore. Choose two abilities. Okay, so what shall they have? Um, yes, very good. Uh, so alchemists, um, let's take a look at what kind of items are in here. Occult items, fire oil, they could make fire oil. Um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, hmm. So I think they definitely use occult items to uh, make stuff, but that it would be something, well, it's something I could include in the move description. It's partially something I could just leave up, leave up to the GM. Um, so let's see. I think they use Quicksilver for sure because that's a very alchemical thing. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm getting some ideas here. Um, so first of all, I think they can spend Quicksilver. I think they can spend Quicksilver to take plus one forward to a stat of their choosing, um, which sounds very strong, and it is, but um, 
it feels like it's on theme and also Quicksilver is expensive and if they overindulge then it's still going to have the same penalty uh, that the wizard suffers. Um, so if, if you drink more Quicksilver doses in a day than your level, you must attempt to resist its negative effects with a con roll. So yes, you could drink Quicksilver and then use the con bonus to <laughs> overcome the, 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 the contest, but that would just be completely counterproductive. Um, so let's start with that. So let's say... Um, Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Cinnabar Elixir. Elixir. Uh, how did I do the formatting? Okay. Uh, so you may spend uh, one they call it in the text dose of quicksilver to take plus one forward to a uh, to one uh, stat um, the Uh, so you, uh, the bonus d cannot exceed plus one, and the uh, the does it have a special name that we could call? Uh, and the quicksilver limit. Magic rules applies. Okay, so there's one ability. Uh, so next, I think it's a little bit too wordy. It should be probably less than this. It's very, very particular. Um, or this is very a uh, uh, fussy for a, a wodu ability. Um, okay, so let's let's reword this. This is too messy. Um, uh, to a maximum a maximum of plus one. You may spend one dose one dose of quicksilver to take plus one forward to one stat. Um, uh, to a maximum of plus one. To one stat at a time. Okay. I think that's a little bit more succinct. Um, Okay, let's let's continue here. Let's see if any of the other classes in the game have some crafting stuff. I don't think they do, but um, you know, the wizard has rituals. Mm. Bless right that's more or less a kind of crafting thing um so let's say oh here's one You may pro, uh, spend uh, do. Let's see if this is cost effective. So, cult items are ten silver. Fire oil is twenty silver. So, yeah, you may spend a cult 
uh, occult occult alchemical ingredients one for one during a rest to produce fire oil. Um, let's see what else could you do make potions right um are potions a thing in this i don't think they are No, they're not. So what about... Um, So, how about this? Um, so, I feel like there's like a Witcher style weapon coding that you could do here. Um, oils so let's say this Um, so, uh, deadly oils, you may spend, uh, a cult alchemical ingredients one for one during a rest to produce a weapon oil. Uh, describe its nature. Uh, describe its nature. When the weapon oil is applied to a weapon, it grants plus three damage uh, to uh, all attacks in a battle. 
battle, but just renders. Uh, but may destroy the weapon uh, as a result. So that's like die of fate, you know, like, oh. When the weapon oil is applied. Applied. When the oil is applied to a weapon, it grants plus three damage to all attacks in battle, but may destroy the weapon as a result. Uh, let's see. Let's so if it's all attacks in a battle, let's move this down to plus two. Um, still very strong. Uh, and so that's one, two, three. Uh, the last thing I think they'll get. Uh, yes. Quicksilver Dowser. <clears throat> Your senses have become attuned to... this strange substance and you can unerringly locate any source of it in your nearby vicinity. Cool. So that's one, two, three, four, that's a class. It's done. Um, yeah, that's that's all there is to it. You spend 15, 20 minutes and you have a class and I think this is pretty cool. The same, like I wanna play this class now. Um, yeah. What's the heading here? I mean, I can just kind of throw this on on the list, pretty much. So make this a heading two. Uh, and there we go. There's another class. Okay, so that's one down. The Gunner and the Death Knight. Okay, those are two we could check out. Uh, let's see then. Maybe the Death Knight? I like the gunner too though, that could be pretty fun. Why not both? Um, let's start with the gunner, because I, I feel like I have some ideas at the back of my head um, that could, could work for this. So. The gunner. Gunners get, what do they get? Gunners get, feel like they probably get awareness. Yeah.
All right, so choose two special abilities. Um, let's take a look at this. What do you call that? Napoleonic drill. So like firing drill. So let's take a look at what guns do. Doesn't have like a reload tag like you would find in most Apocalypse World games.
Um, so it's 2d6 plus 1 plus 2 damage if firing from a stationary position. Um, so one thing they could take would be this. and gun uh, or most of the time honestly uh, just uh, spend a lot of time looking up words <laughs> uh, Be like under shooting. That's somewhat useful.
Hmm. Well, I'm not finding a lot of great terms here. Okay, I'm just gonna have to use words I know. Uh, <laughs> so, let's move, let's do this. Um, so first, uh, an ability, uh, this is an obvious one. Um, uh, you may, <clears throat> Do 2d6 plus 2 damage with guns. Uh, with what is it listed as? Yeah, guns even while moving. Uh, next one. So here's another one. Uh, bayonet training. Uh, you may use a rifle uh, or a rifle or musket or musket. Um, as a great weapon, uh, dealing well, yeah, mm, as a martial weapon. Uh, 
dealing. Actually, sorry, this should be d6 plus 2. This should be dealing d6 plus 1 damage uh, in melee. Uh, next one. Um, called shot. Uh, called shot. Let's let's take a look here. Um, tactics. Ogre, what is it called? Uh, gunner class. Uh, Fusilier. These little cuties. Special oh, advanced mail classes. The gunner. Uh, that's not too useful. This is all the Super Nintendo stuff. So. some more information tactics ogre
Hmm. So that wasn't too useful. Um, so let's see. What could we do with this? Ah, if firing while stationary, you may do plus two da uh, range damage. Firing, uh, when firing a uh, long arm When firing a long, long arm, just make sure this is. Ah. When firing a long gun, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. When firing a long gun uh, while stationary, you deal plus two damage. Boom, big damage. Okay, so this thing's like super strong. Um, the last thing I would suggest for the gunner, I would say maybe maybe something about getting guns or maintaining guns. Yeah. Cuz here's the thing is like they're almost never going to come across guns in dungeons, so when they're going to want to make sure they keep their gun in good condition. So what about this? We'll say um, uh, gunsmith, you are an expert in the maintenance and uh, creation of and manufacturing. Okay, there's another class. Um, they're mostly just about doing damage, but uh, could still be interesting. So let's see.
Okay. Um, so these need to be bolded. Okay, um, so you get awareness. Uh, choose two special abilities, run and gun. You may do D6 plus two damage with guns even while moving. Uh, bayonet training, you may use a long gun as a martial weapon, dealing D6 plus one damage in melee. Called shot, when firing a long gun while stationary, you deal plus two uh, damage. Um, and Gunsmith, you are an expert in the maintenance and manufacturing of firearms. Cool. Um, what is a gender-neutral term for rifleman? Because I feel like this is not... A this is not really, this is not really, um, maybe this is a fusilier because I just want to come up with uh, a word that is, like basically I think this, this character only uses long guns. Uh, they don't really use pistols. Um, uh, rifle man, uh, gender neutral. Huh, well that's not useful. They're still using rifleman as a term. So I'm feeling kind of like Fusilier might be the best option here. Muskets probably describes most of what you know what I think. 
think. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it it doesn't really make sense to say rifleman or fusilier because I don't want to be overly descriptive about um, what type of uh, firearm they use. Um, it could be a musket, it could be a rifle. Uh, de depends on the setting, right? Um, so that took a lot longer than I expected. Um, <laughs> but we got another class, uh, so that's good. Cool. Um, and the last one we're doing tonight, I think, is the Deaf Knight. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's do it. Um, Deaf Knight. Might as well just do it here. Oops. Okay. So be up here. Death Knight. All right, the Death Knight. Um, obviously, they can't be as powerful as Lord Soth. Um, let's think about what they could do. Um, let's think about, so in Final Fantasy Tactics, um, the Death Knight or the Dark Knight spends HP, or no, they can drain HP. That's what they do. They drain HP if they're attack. Um, I think it's probably too strong. Uh, let's see. So what, what skill do they get to start with? Uh, this should be a lowercase a. Awareness, survival, and the gunner. Wait, I, the alchemist. Alchemist gets lore. Uh, okay, so the death knight will get... I think I'm thinking either leadership or athletics. Are there any classes that start with leadership? There aren't. So I'm going to say they get it because they're trained. They used to be knights, right? Um, okay. Uh, so Death Knights get leadership. Uh, choose two special abilities. Uh, so first, I think... They should get something which is like the opposite of the bless ability, um, which is, where is it? Here. Uh, so with holy water, you can anoint items so they're considered holy magical plus three damage versus evil for a short time. Uh, so let's say, um, let's say uh, necrotic, Necrotic uh, strike. Uh, you can choose to roll one less hit die on your next rest to deal plus three damage versus versus good um, for a short time. 
Uh, it should be maybe uh, maybe versus the living. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, you can choose to roll one less hit die on your next rest. See if I can improve this. And yeah. plus the three damage versus living for a short time. Okay. Very, very strong. Um or maybe it is you can choose to roll you can choose to spend resting hit dice one for one to deal plus you can you can spend an amount you can spend hit dice one for one resting hit dice one for one to add a damage modifier a commensurate damage modifier to uh, uh, versus the living so you can spend like three hit dice to deal plus three damage uh, until your next rest that sounds reasonable Okay, so you can, so like this thing could be super strong. Um, okay, so you can choose to spend resting hit dice one for one to deal a commensurate amount of bonus damage versus the living uh, until your next rest. Uh, and um, um, was there anything else I need to add to that? I don't think so. I think that's kind of the, the plan. Um, okay, what else could they do that's really cool? Um, obviously they can't use power word kill. Um, Duel? Feel like that might be a thing. Um, you understand the rituals of uh, dueling and can compel any opponent of equal or greater hit dice, greater HD to duel you in single combat. Um, cool. 
And the last one should be like a terrifying presence. No, that we need two more. Um, terrifying presence. What did I have here? It was, yeah. Um, Terrifying presence. Uh, you can, you may use your you may use your charisma to uh Transfix any uh, to attempt to transfix any intelligent creature or any living creature with terror. Uh, and last, um, oh, um, feel like there's probably a thing in Burning Wheel for this, like you don't need to eat, um, but I don't have my books out. Um, Unnatural corpus. You do not require uh, drink or rations to rest. Yeah. Cool. Well, we made three classes. And it's super easy. Um, so, like, I feel like any of these would be a really cool starting point for a new character. Um, obviously, whether they're balanced or not, who knows? They may be too strong. Uh, but it's worth talking over with your GM, figure out something that would uh, be acceptable for them to, for you to use. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's just a really good way to get started with making a unique and enjoyable character is to design a class for them. And I feel like because you go through this process um, and you give them a class name, it, it, just, it just helps me personally, at least, uh, really dig into the concept and come up with something cool in a way that that point by systems from a list of skills um, generally don't. Um, I'm not saying that's always true. Like obviously Burning Wheel is great for that. Uh, Tenra Bancho Zero is another really good game for point by. Uh, makes it really interesting. But I find uh, that um, a lot of point by systems don't really cut it for me. They don't. They don't get my imagination going in the way that, say, sticking a name on a class 
reifying it that way and then coming up with a bunch of skills to follow the concept does. Um, so I, this is one of the things I love the most about World of Dungeons, how easy it is to make a class. And I hope that this video, as long as it was, um, really helped to showcase some of those positive uh, aspects of the game. Um, yeah. So thanks for watching, and uh, I will see you with more streams uh, in the future.